Hello, my name is Bernard Glasemann and I will present you today with Marcin Dobrovsky something about the misinterpretation of kinematic indicators. And this lecture was given at the, at the Tech Task Workshop in February this year at the IIT in Karakpur in India. I just switch these off here that you can follow the lecture. There are many excellent structural geology textbooks which tell you something about uh, shear sands indicator in the brittle and in the ductile field. And the general uh, idea is that the interpretation of shear sands is straightforward and well understood, like in this compilation on the right side. Uh, where you see uh, different kind of shear sands like bookshelf, uh, shear band boudinage, uh, SC fabric, SC prime fabric, shape preferred orientation, uh, sigma class, delta class, and so on. And uh, it's true, they are well described and well known, confirmed with numerical models. And so in the following, I will show you some textbook examples with uh, Regionally very well constrained shear sands, and we can make some kind of a quiz here. You can, they all have numbers, and uh, you can note the numbers if you think that I show something which is not so clear or which is uh, ambiguous. Well, the first example is from conglomeratic calc schists of the Pjokner in the town window in Austria, and you see a pebble of a pure uh, marble, calcite marble, which is recrystallizing, is feeding wings, which make a beautiful stair stepping. So you can interpret this as some kind of a mantled sigma type porphyroclast, and the shear sense is clearly top to the right. The next example is a winged inclusion from the Veriscum basement in Cap de Creos in, in Spain. Uh, and uh, you see these isolated pinch and swell geometry with these uh, tails which are form this spiral shape. And in analogy to delta class, this is rotating to the left and therefore the shear sense is top to the left. The next example is also uh, from uh, Cap de Creus. It's from a strongly deformed uh, pegmatite and you see some kind of a delta clast uh, which is a crushed uh, large tumulin clast where the crushed fragments are feeding the wings. They also make the spiral shape. Note also the folding to the left of the clasp. And again, this gives you a clear shear sense, which is top to the right. The fourth example is from, from Greece, from Sifnos where you have impure marbles and in these impure bluish gray marbles there's a layer which is more pure and, and it's recrystallized to a coarse grain size and therefore probably a bit more competent. It has been boudinaged in pinch and swell geometries and they make some kind of sigmoidal shape which gives you a nice top to the right shear sense. Next example is also from Greece, from the West Cycladic Detachment System on Seriphos, where are beautiful uh, calcite uh, myelonites. And in these calcite myelonites, there are layers of dolomites, which have been deformed again in pinch and swell bodies. And the example here makes a very nice stair stepping, giving you a top to the right shear sense. This is also some kind of a, a sigmoidal shape uh, quartz. Uh, I wouldn't call this a sigma class, but the sigmoidal shape is aligned in a SC fabric, which is also seen in the 
she started of the whole strokes and this gives you a, a, a nice shear sense which is top to the left. Next example is obviously not in place. It's from these famous quarries in Naxos, where a pegmatite dike intruded into the marbles has been deformed in this kind of bookshelf uh, boudinage and in many structural geology textbooks it has been warned that these are probably not very good shear sense indicators because this could be either interpreted as a shear band boudinage giving you the indicated top to the right shear sense could be also a domino boudinage in which case the dominoes would have being rotated to the left, probably giving you a uh, top to left shear sense. So probably number seven should appear in your list of ambiguous shear sense criteria. The next example is again very clear. This is from Macronisos Island in the Cyclades, where a quartz vein has intruded into the marbles at probably much higher angle it has been rotated into the shear direction has been stretched deformed in this nice pinch and swell geometry and overprinted by these shear band boudinage indicated by these orange uh, arrows giving you a clear top to the right shear sense next example from tinos again Textbook example of shear band boudinage, uh, no question about the top to the right here. Also in Thuros are nice examples from dolomite layers in calcite marbles, uh, high grade metamorphism, so the, the viscosity contrast between dolomite and calcite is not that high, so also the dolomite layer. Uh, uh, was deformed in this nice sigmoidal shaped shear band boudinage giving you a top to the left shear sense. This is a complicated structure, it's a flanking structure from Naxos where a, a cross cutting element or a slip surface, I can indicate this here with the, with the pen, so this slip surface here, oops. Uh, shows an antithetic uh, shear sense and this has been rotated into the shear sense. Uh, note the strong uh, reverse drag here. Uh, so overall this structure is an antithetic flanking structure uh, giving you a top to the right shear sense. Again a nice uh, SC prime fabric type or shear band boudinage, where uh, this example from Oman, uh, from uh, Janosch Ure group, and uh, you see this nice, again, this sigmoidal shape of foliation here between these uh, C primes, uh, which gives you a nice top to the left shear sense. An example from marble myelonites from the metamorphic Mesozoic on the Austro-Alpine uh, in the Brenner Mesozoic. And this is again a very nice shear band boudinage giving you in this picture top to the left shear sense. Again, a maybe complicated structure because at the first glance, this looks like a shear band which would give you a top to the left shear sense. But if you look at the uh, central marker lines, which makes this very pronounced reverse drag here, and also this nice reverse drag here on the other side, this might be better interpreted as an antithetic A-type flanking fold, which would give you a top to the right shear sense. Very nice SCC prime fabric where you can see the C which is parallel to the uh, foliation in these orthognizes here from Argios Georgios in Greece. You can recognize very nicely the C prime which I'm outlining here 
so that's the C prime and in between you can see the sigmoidal S here so this gives you a nice top to the right shear another SCC prime fabric again from the west cyclic detachment system in care uh, the orange arrows indicate the C primes and this is again uh, top to the right shear sense and so we have seen very nice examples and hope most of you agree with few exceptions uh, uh, about the shear sense so what is the problem here and the problem is that half of the interpretations that I gave you were the wrong interpretation we know from other shear sense criteria and from the regional geology that the shear strengths of eight uh, sorry nine examples of these 18 uh, was wrong and mostly these wrong examples are from these families of structures from flanking structures boudinage winged inclusions and confusion about scc prime fabric versus actual plank cleavage so in the following we'll have a closer look at these four different structures and most of what i'm going to show you here is from this review paper about sense and nonsense of shear reloaded together with Martin Dabrowski and Martin Schöpfer, which appeared in the anniversary volume of the Journal of Structural Geology. So generally we can distinguish between uh, kinematic indicators, which are non-perturbation induced structures where we have a homogeneous rock with marker shapes, marker lines, and by deforming them with a background flow will result in final shapes which might give you information about the shear sense. It's more complicated with perturbation induced structures where we have different rheologies, for example here a rigid core and surrounded by a weak rim embedded in a matrix again with a different viscosity and when this is deformed the different rheologies uh, create some kind of a perturbation flow and adding this with the background flow you might result in a final shape which is not always uh, easy to interpret so let's start with the most complicated structure Let's start with flanking structures. And to make a very complex story uh, a bit more simple, we want to reduce it here to four different types. So here on these in this left column, I'm indicating here. So these are flanking structures in red. This indicates a slip surface. Blue indicates a central marker line. And in this left column, we see an extensional offset of the central marker line. And in the right column, I'm indicating here, you see a contractual offset of this central marker line. And the first row here are structures which have a normal drag where the marker line is deflected into the slip surface consistent with the shear sense and the second row here gives you structure with a reverse drag where the central marker line is deflected into the cross cutting element against the shear sense so uh, let's look at the behavior of such slip surfaces in ductile flow focusing first here on a simple shear in this left column up here you have the uh, uh, off axis more circle uh, which is a nice way of showing the physical space with the deformed unit square and the more circle i don't know if you are familiar with this kind of more cir circles but it doesn't matter for this lecture this would be an old lecture important is where the more circle touches the y-axis like for example here in ideal simple shear 
uh, that's the line, uh, that's the eigenvector of the deformation tensor, that's the uh, uh, orientation which is not rotating. And in simple shear, if we look here at the physical space, this, I'm outlining this here, this would be the, the shear uh, some boundary and the, this eigenvector which is non-rotating. All other slip surfaces would rotate into the shear direction but there are four different sectors where you see different behavior. Most important are these uh, uh, instantaneous stretching axes I'm outlining here, or the principal stress directions, which are per definition orientations, uh, which have no instantaneous shear, and therefore they are separating uh, sectors uh, which, where the slip surface will experience a different shear sense. Another important line is here this gamma dot, which is uh, an orientation where the marker line would experience a maximum rotation rate or no instantaneous length change. And this is separating sectors where the slip surface uh, would shorten or stretch. So uh, let's go this uh, quickly through. So this would be the orientation of a slip surface, which is corrotating. It has a synthetic shear, but it's instantaneously shortening. Uh, this would be a slip surface, which is now antithetic shearing. It's corrotating, but it's still shortening. Uh, this is uh, again a slip surface which is uh, antithetic shearing, it's co-rotating, but it's instantaneously stretching. And uh, this uh, orientation would be a slip surface, which is synthetically shearing, it's co-rotating and it's stretching. Uh, I forgot to say we can uh, simplify this here because mechanical models have shown that slip surfaces uh, which are very long compared to their thickness, uh, behave like uh, a passive marker. So we can compare this with a kinematic model here. So let's go to the more complicated case. In case of general shear, if we look at the Mohr circle, the Mohr circle is now cross-cutting the y-axis here and here in A1 and A2. And these are now two eigenvectors and they are separating these sector which are bluish here and these are now sectors where we have an antithetic rotation of the slip surface here so all these sectors here i'm outlining here are similar although different in uh, shape and orientation to simple shear and we have uh, two new sectors here these bluish sectors where we have slip surfaces which are counter shearing uh, but they have a synthetic slip, and this one here is instantaneously shortening, and this one here is instantaneously stretching. So you can imagine that depending on your flow type and on the orientation of your slip surface, that you can create a family of very complicated structures. There's some uh, model results, uh, which we modeled with uh, milimin, uh, from Martin Bobrovsky. And so there are four finite structures. The first structure uh, here, uh, that's a sinistral shear. And it looks like a shear band, but it has this very strong reverse drag here that you can see here. And it might be very difficult in nature to distinguish this from this structure here, which has a textual shear sense and which also saw, shows this uh, very strong reverse drag. And uh, so this is some kind of a mirror image of the shear sands, and uh, this might create confusion. Uh, in the row below, we have now flanking structures with a contractual offset. You see this nice thrust here, and this thrust on that side here. I'm outlining, uh, but this uh, was modeled in, in sinistral shear, and you see a thrust in the other direction here, which gives you a very similar shape, but this has been modeled with a textual shear sense. So you can imagine that these structures 
form during progressive deformation. So the slip surface might rotate from a sector where it's experienced, for example, a synthetic shear crossing the principal stress direction into a sector where it's experiencing an antithetic shear. And this is so complicated that I can show you this only this movie here. So textual shear sense, idle simple shear, the slip surface is rotating into the shear direction and the marker line is offset. And uh, now there's no offset and again it's offsetting again and shear sense is reversed again, no offset here and offsetting again. Let's start this uh, once more. So we start with synthetic shear sense rotating the slip surface, cross-cutting principal stress direction, shear sense is reversed. So the extensional offset uh, is closed here, lower offset, and again, extensional offset here, shear sense is reversed. We are crossing again the principal stress direction and creating this contractual offset here and this nice S-type flanking structure. So, the next family of structures I want to show is boudinage, and there are these uh, seminal papers of uh, Ben Goskow and Case Plus Kier, measuring thousands of natural examples and dividing the boudinage in two big groups in the so called uh, shear band boudinage and in the so called uh, uh, domino boudinage. And shear band boudinage are called shear band boudinage because the uh, boudins are separated by these synthetic slip surfaces uh, of a shear band, where in case of domino boudinage, uh, the slip surface between the boudins are at a very high angle. And if the domino is deformable, they might uh, uh, form these A type flanking folds here. So we used Millamin to model domino boudinage. On this left column here, you see uh, a low viscosity ratio of M, meaning that the boudins are 10, 10 times harder than the matrix. And in these right columns here, you see models with a viscosity contrast of 1000, meaning that the uh, boudins are 1000 times harder than the matrix. And in this column here, you see a shear strain of 10, ideal simple shear, and you see a shear strain of 10 here, and these two columns have a shear strain of 20, so quite high shear strain. If we look at the high viscosity contrast, the dominant Boudins are in terms of shear sense well behaving. Shear sense is textural here and the dominoes are rotating into the shear direction. Although it's surprising that you need quite high shear strain, a gum of 20 to create uh, structures like that, uh, which is due to these big suction forces between the, the interbudine surfaces. It's more surprising if you look at the uh, low viscosity contrast because now the boudins itself are deforming and are creating structures like this one which I'm outlining here with these with the uh, with in, in this orange triangle here, which look very similar to our shear band boudinage but having a different shear band. So the shear band boudinage from this paper of of uh, Ben Gauss comment case plus here, here is sinistral, but the structures here in our model, which looks very similar, have been modeled under textual shear sense. So this might create confusion. Therefore, we'll have a closer look here. That's a textual a model with textual simple shear, and you see the boudins, uh, which are rotating into a, a textual orientation, but the uh, Buddhas are internally deforming, uh, creating not the A-type flanking structure, but creating this very nice sigmoidal shape. And this might be easily confused with the shear band Buddhinage, which was created during sinusoidal shear. But remember, these are numerical models, which were modeled in textual.
Next structures are objects which are rotating in ductile flow. And the left column here shows you the famous sigma clasts, uh, you know, from your textbooks, which are mantle porphyro clasts, where the clast is feeding the wings. The, eventually, uh, these wings are rotating in this delta shape into the clast. The important thing here is that the wings are fixed on both sides, so during the formation, they stay on the same side of the clast. There are rolling structures, which are not ambiguous shear sense criteria. They are uh, dragging the foliation into the shear sense. And there are winged inclusions, which are a bit different to delta class, although similar. There are pinch and swell objects, which are inherently stable in shear and start to rotate. But the difference is that the uh, left side wing here is still on the left side here. But here it starts to rotate with the object and end up on the right side. So the leading wing becomes the trailing wing and vice versa, which is different to the, uh, to the classical delta class. So let's have a look to the winged inclusion. First, I want to show you these uh, beautiful fine element model with this enormous fine remeshing, which was uh, necessary to model the, these uh, these uh, uh, pinched ends of this uh, pinch and swell geometry. So these are model results. In the first column here, you see uh, Newtonian uh, viscosity, and here you have power law with a stress exponent of three, and here stress exponent of five. Uh, these two rows here show you the apparent viscosity change during the formation. And note that the marker lines, the bluish marker lines here, are just passive marker lines outlining the deformation in the matrix. And uh, the first thing that we can observe here is that uh, all finite uh, shapes after revolution of about 180 degree of these winged inclusions are more or less similar and not very strongly dependent on the power law exponent, although the finite strain, it's gamma 20 here, it's only gamma 18.6 here and 18.2 here, are a bit different in the power law. Anyway, the second thing which is interesting is the enormous matrix deformation that you see with these folding and refolding uh, uh, in uh, here. and Surprisingly, you need quite very high strain for a full revolution of these uh, winged inclusions. So if you see a winged inclusion, which you can show has been rotated by 180 degrees, you have a shear strain uh, of about uh, 20. So let's have a look at the movie. Uh, the pinch and swell object is uh, 100 times harder than the matrix at the beginning, apparent viscosity, uh, stress exponent of n equals 3, uh, and you see the deformation in the matrix, and now the trailing wing flips over and becomes the leading wing of these shapes. But what's the problem with the shear sand? Let's look at these matrix of finite structures. Uh, the first column here is the uh, starting condition, gamma zero. That's a shear strain of 10, 20, uh, shear strain of 30, and shear strain of 40. And the uh, rows gives you different uh, objects with a thicker swell here in this uh, row and a thinner swell in this row down here. And what we can immediately see is that the rotational behavior is, of course, a function of the, of the thickness of the swell. What's interesting, all these model results have been modeled uh, under textual simple shear. But if we look at these structures here, which I'm outlining here with these orange rectangles, we have shapes, for example, like that one here, which have a sigmoidal geometry, which would probably indicate uh, a sinistral shear sense, so I give you an apparent sinistral shear sense, it's almost like a mica fish, and this might create confusion because if we see an object which has been frozen 
in uh, these situations here, we might interpret this as a sigmoid with a sinusoidal shear sign, but it's just the beginning of another revolution of this ringed inclusion, and this uh, gives rise to uh, confusion with shear signs. The next example uh, is well known from structural geology textbook that we have to be very careful with uh, the distinction of compressional crenellation cleavage or axial plane cleavage versus extensional crenellation cleavage or SCC prime fabric. And uh, this uh, picture shamelessly stolen from Ralph Hetzel. Uh, shows very nicely that in these limbs of this fold, the actual plane has a more shallow angle to the uh, to the layering, and you can easily, if you just see this uh, section here, you can easily confuse this with a with a C plane like that one, a C prime plane like that one, and some uh, sigmoidal. Uh, parts in here between, and just to show samples, uh, that's a SCC prime fabric uh, here on the left side. Sorry, this would be the C prime, and in between you see this uh, sigmoidal shape, and the same you can see here. That's the C prime. Uh, but uh, we know from the regional geology that the example of the left side that's the actual plane cleavage developed due to pressure solution of a larger scale fold in this outcrop here and on the right side it's from the west circulating detachment system from a shear zone where you have this anisotropy of schists and marble in between which are, are prone to form these scc prime fabrics and there are many examples in literature uh, where people have interpreted SCC prime fabrics, uh, which could be also interpreted uh, as actual plain cleavage. So one has to be very careful. So summing up, uh, we uh, showed you at the beginning 18 examples, and I told you that nine of these examples, uh, I gave you the wrong shear sands. So this is somehow the solution to our quiz game that we were playing. And if you look at your list with numbers, you should record all these numbers I'm showing you here. And let's quickly go through these examples where I gave you the wrong ones. The first shear sand was from the Tauern window, this marble pebble, which I uh, told you might be a, uh, with this nice stair stepping a sigma club, but indeed it's a winged inclusion which is probably starting to flip over for another revolution. And this is confirmed by this nice SCC uh, fabric that we see in the calc schist in the matrix. And it's also well known from the clock Nanep that the shear sand is popped to the north northwest. Next example, which when I saw this in the field, was very happy to find this beautiful winged inclusion, uh, is not a winged inclusion. It's a folded pinch and swell, uh, quartz vein, and you see uh, that you see abundant folding also in the mix outlined here. The actual plane and folding is not only confined like in the numeric model uh, to the uh, to this part of, to these embayments of the object here, and away from the object, you see more or less the foliation which is undisturbed. In this outcrop, you see that the folding is uh, continuing, and, and that this is clearly a folded pinch as well, but it looks perfectly like a winged include. This nice sigmoidal object is, again, our interpretation, a uh, winged inclusion, which is better consistent with the top to the east shear uh, on Thiefnos and this pinch and swell pure marble uh, object got instable and is rotating to the left. Also, the example from Cyrus was wrong. We know from very well that the shear sands here 
is not top to the left but top to the right and uh, so these are not sheer band boudinage although they have this very nice sigmoidal shape foliation here but these are deformable uh, boudinage because the viscosity contrast between the dolomite and the calcite marble is not that high at these metamorphic condition uh, giving you the impression of a sheer band boudinage but it's a deformable uh, domino boudinage the example from oman which i got from janos uh, uh, i gave, oh, gave you also the wrong shear sands and uh, again uh, you might be confused by this very nice s shape uh, geometry here and uh, nice c primes here uh, but in that case, it's a deformable domino foliation boudinage, and the correctness of the sands uh, would be top to the right, comparable with our numerical model. And when Arne Grobe uh, showed this with the correct interpretation as an, at, the, at the International Congress in his talk, there were structural geologists. Uh, almost interrupting him with shouting that he got the shear sand wrong. But the correct shear sand is also confirmed by these calcite veins, which are pinched and swell, uh, giving you the top to the right shear sand. Uh, the example from the hand sample from the Brenda Mesozoic, uh, which has also this nice uh, uh, shear band boudinage, is also a domino boudinage and the correct uh, would be in that direction here it's complicated by these uh, secondary uh, faults here and uh, there's almost no displacement gradient uh, because in that case we should see more like flanking structure but the whole displacement is here transferred into this layer down here and the top to the right shear sands is confirmed by these by this nice uh, mica fish, millimeter sized mica fish here in this impure layer at the bottom of this sample. So that sample you probably got all right and I, ex I got it wrong because of course I was impressed by this very nice reverse drag here and therefore I immediately interpret that as a A-type flanking fold. But comparing these with our, uh, it's a special type of a shear band which shows a very pronounced reverse drag comparable to our model here. We also see this very pronounced reverse drag. And this happens when you have a shear band under general shear where these cross cutting element, the slip surface, is in a meta stable orientation of the shortening eigenvector. But during ongoing slip, the central marker line is accuming displacement from the center towards the tip of the uh, slip surface. And this creates this very strong reverse drag, which might uh, be confused with a type flanges. This nice SCC prime fabric, unfortunately not a SC prime fabric, it's a fold, it's a beautiful actual plain cleavage from the limb showing this asymmetric actual uh, plain crenellation cleavage and in the field we could uh, map this fold on a larger scale and it's not in, in, formed in a shear zone. Last but not least this nice thrust here which might give you the impression of a top to the uh, right shear sands but uh, uh, in, uh, it's a it's a slip surface which is rotating to the left, creating this antithetic offset comparable with our uh, numeric model results. And although it's some kind of a shortening, it's a thrust, the shear sands of the whole system is top to the left. So we can conclude that the interpretation of kinematic indicators is not always trivial, especially if we have different rheologies involved, heterogeneities, uh, which create structures which monoclinic symmetries under high finite strain, which are sometimes really counterintuitive and 
things might be even more complex, and this is also my outlook that uh, that we need more numeric models, especially models which are uh, can model really high strain deformation, and especially models which include uh, mechanical and isotropy. So thank you very much for your attention.